All right, welcome to Reimagining Company Culture. Today we are welcoming our guest, Brooke James. She is a coach, independent advisor, and founder of The Grief Coach. Brooke, how are you? Hi, thank you so much for having me. It's so good to be here. It's so good to see you. I'm so glad that we have reconnected and I'm excited to dive into our conversation, but I would love to start out with just an introduction of yourself, including your pronouns um, and what has recently brought you joy in life. Sure. Um, So my name is Brooke James. I live in New York. My pronoun pronouns are she and her. And uh, something that brought me joy recently is I got my second shot um, on Monday. And I'm so excited to hug uh, some family members who I have not been able to in a long time and friends. So I'm very excited about that. That's amazing. The value of a good hug is very underrated. Maybe not now, but I feel like a good hugger is a great skill I would endorse on LinkedIn. (laughs) Absolutely. And I think like, this past year we've seen just like I don't don't know about you I live by myself so like the first part of the pandemic I was like solo before I went and stayed with some family and just like being by yourself and like not hugging yeah like I'm a big hugger so like that was very weird for me so I'm really excited to be able to hug everyone I know again oh my gosh well congratulations that's awesome I'm due to get my second one soon so I will be on the same same boat with you yes yes excellent Um, I wanted to ask you also questions around your experience and the podcast you started for folks who are watching the video. You can see your very professional mic as well. (laughs) Um, But you started out in a larger consulting and financial like sector industry and then moved over starting the grief coach. What really inspired you to make that switch? Sure, absolutely. So uh, I, like most young and ambitious people, thought, you know, I need to go into finance and tech management consulting, um, and that is a good, safe thing to do. And um, while I learned a lot of things from all of those jobs, I didn't love any of them. And um, I will get into this a little bit more later, but really didn't felt seen as a whole person. Um, like in my personal life, because I was a young single person was not as valued as someone who had kids that they needed to leave the office to take care of. Um, and I can give a few more anecdotes on that in a little bit. Um, happy I did it. But um, when my dad got sick, which is now part of my professional story because of the podcast, which is like kind of funny, um, I um, realized how like fragile life is. So um, my dad got sick. I stopped working the week we put him into hospice. And after he died, after about three and a half weeks, I really was like, oh, I really have not enjoyed what I've been doing and how I've been spending my time and life is really fragile. And I want to be enjoying like what I do every day and not like dread going to work. Um, so took some time off and then started doing some consulting for small businesses in the health and wellness space, did some stuff with a real estate firm, um, worked with an advertising agency for about a year and a half. And, um, while all of that was happening, I was like, I'm going to write a book about grief because no one knows how to talk about this. And then um, writing a book is really hard. And so (laughs) I stopped, but I had this outline um, and I was thinking about it a lot. And this is like such a New York story of how the (laughs) podcast started. I was at a gala sitting across the table from this woman and she was, she's at a, um, major streaming service and is the director of podcast content there. And she's like, oh, you would be great on a podcast. And I was like, (laughs) well, actually, I'm working on a book that might be a good podcast. And she's like, oh, we should get coffee. And she's like my podcast guardian angel because she read through all of my stuff. And she said, you know, this is really good. And you know, when you are doing something and you have no idea if it's a good idea or not, I think that's something yeah. probably a lot of people can relate to. But then someone who was in the field, like validated it. And I was like, oh, like maybe this could be a thing. And so I worked with her to get it off the ground. And she gave me a lot of feedback on early stuff. And um, that's how the podcast started. Um, but really it's, I mean, we can talk about a little bit more about how it's progressed, but it's now, um, in episode 53 is going to be released today. Oh my gosh. Uh, exciting! I have an audience in over 70 countries and I've invested no money in marketing. So that's That's amazing. Amazing. Um, so I don't know. It's been very rewarding. I'm really, 
yeah. proud that I'm doing it. That sounds really rewarding. And you are also like seeing other like people experience grief and sharing their stories. And yeah. um, I, I just told you as well, I was listening to some of the podcasts before this call too. And they're really interesting stories because you're right. We do not talk about this a lot. Yeah. We actually don't want to talk about this and get really, really uncomfortable. So I would love to know in terms of, you mentioned the progression of the podcast and conversations you're having is what your ultimate goal and vision is for, um, for launching. Sure. Um, so thank you for listening, first of all. <laughs> um, and um, so I started it really because I was so frustrated. And this is why I started working on the book because I was couldn't believe actually that so many people didn't know what to say to me. And I was like, that is such a disservice. And like, I have, there's, there's not a way to say this without sounding like it sounds. I have a lot of friends and, <laughs> um, and that's something that's really, really important to me yeah. um, is my relationships with my friends and my family. And that is like very sacred to me. Um, and to your previous question was not really well respected when I was working in a corporate job and I wanted to mm-hmm. like leave to go have dinner with friends and they would be like, it's seven o'clock. Why are you leaving? And I'd be like, uh, cause we're sitting here for optics. Like, no, yeah. bye. I'll log on at nine 30 when the client emails back. And, um, but that's neither here nor there. And so <laughs> I, I couldn't believe that so many of my friends had no idea what to say. And they would say that to me, um, which I really appreciated because so many people said like, I'm so sorry, like may his memory be a blessing. And I was just like, like, that's not helpful (laughs) to me. Like people would say, I'm sorry. And I would literally say like, so am I like, this is the worst thing that ever happened. And you could just yeah. see them be like, Oh, I don't know what to say. I, like, know what I to thought say that's next. what I was yeah. supposed to say. <laughs> right. Um, so the podcast started not only so like w- people who were grief adjacent could um, kind of learn and hear stories so they could be better empathetic, but then also, so those who are grieving, like I wanted to read every single book about grief. And I really felt like a lot of them like weren't talking to me as a millennial. And yeah. so, and that's my biggest audience. Um, but really wanting to share stories because when you are grieving, you feel so isolated and so alone that, and almost you're like, am I doing this right? because there's no model for it because no one talks about it. So that piece, the grief adjacent, how do you be more empathetic? And then also the logistics pieces, you know me, I'm so type A. I love a list. (laughs) Like, and I was like, dealing with my dad literally like dying in his bedroom in hospice. And then I had to like call the credit card company and deal with power of of attorney, like do all the bank account stuff. Um, I had (laughs) one of his friends said to me, well, don't forget about the Amex points. It's like, who would ever think to think about the Amex points? And then like, where's the will? And like none of this. So my heart is literally breaking into a thousand pieces. And I'm having to try to figure this stuff out. And I think I was in a unique experience. So I was 30 when he died. Um, My parents were divorced. And so most of my friend, not everyone, but most of my friends who had lost a parent, it either happened when they were young. Mm -hmm. um, So a child, a teenager. So they weren't getting involved in this logistical piece or their parents had, um, were either still together or they were remarried. So there was a spouse doing all of this. So I was having to learn all this and I couldn't turn to any of my friends Mm -hmm. to talk through how to do it. And the people who were giving me advice were my parents' friends, which was just kind of like bizarre. I'm not going to be the last person who's my age who has to deal with this. So especially early on, um, I focused a lot on end of life paperwork. That's something no one wants to talk about because they think they're going to like jinx their life. Um, <laughs> but like, where is the will? What does the advanced care directive say? Um, and I can go into that a little bit more because I think that that's so important. Um, but those three pieces were really what I'm trying to accomplish. So now it's just getting this to the people who need it, um, which has been happening. So it's been growing pretty steadily, which has been pretty amazing. Cause like, I didn't have any media background. Like I do all of the audio, I do all of the like Instagram, like and making all of the assets and I'm scheduling all the guests and I'm doing everything. So 
it's been like, it's a labor of love. A <laughs> one woman show over there, but it, it is, it is the organic growth. It really shows that this is something that people are interested in. There is a market for this because, you know, people want to have this relevant content where they're at this stage in their life where, and it's really unfortunate this past year that a lot of folks are unfortunately dealing with mm -hmm. grief because of COVID and the pandemic. And it's a really unique way of experiencing this as well, because I know you talked yeah. about on the podcast too, there's a lot of Zoom wakes and funeral. There's just, the, which is crazy to think about. It's crazy, um, yeah. But I wanted to go back to one of the things that you brought up in terms of friends and your support system really wanting to be there for you, because mm -hmm. I think that as we're thinking about how this continual post-COVID future of work world is going to go. A lot of companies and individuals on teams are like, how can we support employees in their full selves at, at work? And part of that is grief and leading into those uncomfortable conversations. Um, so I would love to ask you in terms of what is helpful for employees to actually think about and say when they're trying to support employees who they know or teammates are going through a really hard time with grief, they've lost someone close to them, but also don't want to put an undue burden on them to just respond. And also like, you may not have met this person in person and they're different from your friends. So yeah. Uh, yeah. I wanted to ask them. That's a great question. I'm going to go into a couple of examples because yeah, that'd be great. This, this is something, and I have like a real life. So my dad was sick. He had cancer for six months before he passed away. Um, and I think there is this really interesting thing in specifically American culture where people sing song like, how are you? Like, how's it going? Yes. And they don't actually care how you are. It's like mm -hmm. part of hello, how are you? Like, yeah. and they want you to say, oh, I'm great. Thank you. And then that's it. Yeah. Um, and so my dad was in the hospital. He was getting worse. And someone at work was like, hey, how's it going? How are you doing? And I just like. I was like, I'm terrible. I was like, my dad is really sick. Like, yeah. and I'm re really blunt. I overshare a lot. It's just a <laughs> thing that happens. Like I already three times this podcast, I was like, oh, maybe you shouldn't have said that. But <laughs> anyway, <laughs> like, I think that it is like, don't ask someone how they're doing. If you know they are dealing with a sick person at home, if you know they just had a death, they're like, how are you? Like anyone who's lost someone like knows that tone of voice that is just like, dreadful frankly and um all of these people mean well but like if you know someone is dealing with a hard time don't ask them how they're doing if you are not ready to hear the answer because what then we as either caretakers or grievers do sometimes I didn't do this a lot but I did sometimes of like oh I'm fine like things are okay and you have to like lie and pretend and that really, I felt like was doing a disservice to me. Um, so I think just like, hey, heard what's going on. Like, want you to know I'm here for you. If you have bandwidth to take something off of someone's plate, specifically at work, um, I think that that is a really wonderful thing of like, hey, do you want me to lead this meeting? Like some people like a distraction. I want to like caveat all of this with, there are some people who are not trying to deal with their feelings and they're going to throw themselves into work. Yeah. But for the people who do need a break or they're caregiving at home, they are dealing with funeral logistics, whatever it is to offer to take something off of a colleague's plate um, or like a friend's plate. I think before you and I started recording, we were talking about, I was always really stressed out when people would ask like, how can I help you? Because I then <laughs> had to question. think, which, and everyone means so well, and I yeah. know that, but I then had to think, okay, how much time is behind that ask? How much money is behind that ask? Like, what do I need? And then what can I ask this person to do? Which I don't need another thing on my plate. So don't ask someone what you can do to help. Say, hey, I'm gonna take this meeting for you. Like, I'll send you notes. Say, if it's a friend outside of work or someone like, you know, you have people that you're pretty close with at work of like, hey, I'm gonna uh, send over a housekeeper to your house. Like, that is a great thing. I, I hate cleaning. I only clean when I'm really stressed out. So if <laughs> someone like, um, like friends would come over and clean or cook. Um, if you're sending food, don't send only unhealthy food because if you eat like, 
am I allowed to, if I'm not going to swear, but if you like are not allowed to swear, (laughs) okay. If you're eating like shit, you feel like shit. So, um, like I really appreciated when people would, um, send a chicken roasted vegetables and then like cookies. Like I, I like cookies, but then (laughs) you feel good. Um, so I think like, what else are things that you can do as a coworker that would be helpful? I really appreciated when people sent instead of flowers, um, a candle, uh, nice lotion, uh, like face masks, like something. So you like feel like you're taking care of yourself. Yeah. Um, because if, especially after someone dies, our instinct is flowers or like a fruit basket. Right. And (laughs) like a fruit basket is fine, but you can see my apartment behind me. I had five bouquets of flowers on my coffee table, which is not very big. Like that was crazy. And then they all died at the same time. So not great. Not great. So if you can like be a little bit creative about what you're sending, I think that makes a really big difference. Um, if your coworker has children, maybe say like, Hey, I'm gonna, and you're close enough with them of like, I'm going to take the kids for a few hours so you can like deal with whatever, or have some time to yourself. Like there's so much that you can do that's helpful that is um, not necessarily like it's a little bit more creative. Another thing I really think is important if it's someone you're close enough with is do you want to talk about it or do you want to be distracted? Um, Because depending on how you're doing mentally, like you need different things. But back to your original question of like a coworker who I'm assuming is someone you're not close with, I would say just like, Hey, heard about this, like sending you strength. Like that is, it's so simple and like people overthink it and they want it to be perfect, but like that's enough. Yeah. You don't need to add flowery language or just, you know, like have a chipper, plucky, good, good attitude about it as well. It's just like, we know, you know, your coworker, your teammate, your friend is going through something really hard, but it sounds like what you're saying is to really acknowledge what's happening and also be really intentional and authentic, but also creative about how, if you want to take that next step and be, you know, offer support in some sort of way, really think about how you're doing that. Um, which is another kind of question I had in terms of how we're thinking about the responsibility of companies and organizations to really provide resources to employees. I think one of the only benefits I can think of is like a bereavement period, which is most likely not going to be, you know, more than a few weeks and like a lot of employees. Less. Are, yeah, less. Five, three to five days is typical. Which is which is crazy because it's yeah. like, do you think, you know, if no. this is going to be something that is only a couple of days worth of processing and just what do you think companies can do to really support employees, especially as we know, this is something that is not going away. Like we were talking about this before, but we are all going to experience grief at some point of our lives and losing someone. So how can companies really support their folks? That's a great question. Um, Obviously, I'm a big proponent of like longer bereavement policies. It is frankly offensive that a company is only offering three to five days, Um, especially like if you lost more than one person in a year, you only have those three to five days for the whole year, which is like crazy, Crazy. Um, depending on your company's sick policy or vacation policy, like, and frankly, like how much they are respectful to you as a whole human versus a worker, um, that could go a lot of different ways. Um, I think that the best thing that, um, a company can do is to realize that grief does not happen at the same time. Um, and sometimes it spreads out. So like milestones are really hard, especially the first year, but like, so we're recording in April, the two year for my dad is Saturday. And so like I have the lead up is oftentimes worse than the actual day. So I have like my Friday, my calendar is blocked off because I don't want to be thinking about anything. Um, And so I think if companies can kind of realize that, okay, someone may be going through a loss and they may not need, especially during pandemic, you don't need to take time off to plan a funeral during pandemic because you can't have one in most places, Um, which is, I think, what bereavement was really for originally. Um, But understanding that it hits at different points and you can't control it. I 
do think the one thing that has been good about being remote for grievers is you can turn your camera off because sometimes you cry at really Um, inopportune times and something like triggers something and a lot of people can't control it. So kind of just being respectful of that, we've now seen people can be working remote. So if someone is grieving, um, being respectful of the mental health and like, okay, maybe when people are back in the office, this person's going to be home for two weeks, like, and they're working, but they might need to take a beat a few times a day. And like, mm-hmm. that's okay, because we're all better workers, no matter our circumstance, if we feel like our boss and our company sees us as a whole person, trusts us and respects us. So any way to show that I think is critical for companies. Yeah. I think companies can also like to your point, be creative about how they think about offering this bereavement period. And I heard in another kind of episode of your podcast as well, it's time after, you know, someone has passed away, but also the, you know, what you just talked about in terms of the anniversary is coming up and just people experience things at different times. So I think it is super important to think about that whole person. And you also mentioned in kind of your response, the world of remote work and how things are really blending together. And we've had conversations around healthy boundaries and really how to establish them Yeah, and rejiggering them, reworking them. What is your philosophy about healthy boundaries at work and really thinking about you know, what you, what you need to set there. Um, I want to, before I answer this, just say that it's really hard for a lot of people to set a boundary um, and to give yourself grace that like, it is difficult because we are not taught to do that. And I think, especially as women, like, I don't know if you've had this experience or you have friends who've had this experience of like, you want everyone to like you. So you want to say yes to everybody. And, um, you, we have ingrained in our heads, or at least a lot of people do that. Like, if you have to say yes to every single thing that your boss asks you to do, even if you don't have time to do it, like how many people listening to this have worked late because they were like, yes, of course I can help when you didn't have time. Like, so really, I think, that boundary setting, I think, is, and when you can stand up for yourself to set a boundary, I think is a really attractive thing. And I do think people at the end of the day respect it, even if they're sometimes annoyed. Um, (laughs) But like, I, and I've done this, and I've had to do a lot of work to get here. Like I'm in therapy, like I read a lot of self help books. I talk to friends about this. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) You know, like, is you have to just say like, oh, I have a lot. You can say, I have a lot on my plate right now. Like what's the priority of this compared to these other things? Uh, is this some, is this urgent? Do you need this today? If so, these other things are going to be pushed back. Um, I think living at, or I almost said living at work, um, oh, working we from work. home. <laughs> we do live at work. Um, so many people in our age cohort specifically feel like, oh, well, I'm just going to do these couple more things on my to-do list because there's always more work to do. Always. There is never going to be a time yeah. where there is not more to do. Yeah. So you sacrificing an hour of your personal life for a company, like I, I is not necessarily going to allow you to then bring your best, most creative strategic self to work, depending on what sort of work you do. Um, We need personal time to rest. We need to sleep. We need physical activity. Like we need quality time with people. And so if it's a pandemic and you're making phone calls, like I call my mom every day, like, and I talk to her every day, but I talk to my friends on the phone all the time. Um, that you need time away from work in order to be then bringing your best self to work. So I think the best way I have found, and again, this is hard, is to just say, okay, like happy to get that done for you tonight, but then these other pieces are not going to get done until Friday. Yeah. Is that okay? And get it in writing always. <laughs> Oh. Get it in writing. Yeah, absolutely. And burnout culture is definitely real and just always hustling. And there aren't an unlimited amount of hours in the day to finish the endless amount of work. And you're right. It's not good for you, yourself, your 
physical and emotional mental health, but also for the company at the end of the day, if you've been burning the midnight oil for 23 hours, the odds are the end product is not going to be the best. And, you know, right. the company won't, won't want that either. So. Right. And I think the bringing up burnout is important. Um, a uh, company, a friend is at a uh, small startup, 20 some people. They had two people resign in like a three month period because they were burnt out. Okay. And then without other jobs. And then they had other people actively interviewing for other jobs. Like burnout yeah. is real. Like, and so I think that managers, com- founders, whoever, to really take care to know that like if people are burnt out and don't feel valued, they will leave. And so as a manager, a founder, someone in leadership, it's your responsibility to be sure that you are respecting someone's personal time. There will always be times when it's like, oh, this week is really busy. This month is really busy. But if it is always really busy, people will leave. Yeah, people will definitely Leave and I think it's interesting that you bring up managers and leaders and just folks who are leading the organization in general, because I think it's one thing to definitely say, take a mental health day or, you know, take as much time as you need. But what I see you doing is never, I've never seen you take a personal day. I've never seen you, you know, not on right. past 11 PM. I think it's important to set that example too, especially if you are working at a startup or you're working at a larger organization where you can see people that are online it's just you ingest those things so even if you're saying it do you really do you really mean what you're saying absolutely and as a leader you should understand that people are looking to you and what happens specifically startups but a lot of places don't get give effective um, people management training so like people just don't know it's not any fault of theirs but they were not tr- being a people manager is different than being a good uh technical domain expert, like in whatever field you're in. And so most people get promoted because they're an expert in whatever field they're in, not because they're good people managers. So that's something that is also important for people to remember. And really, I think leadership across companies to take care, to lead by example, also be supportive if someone does need to take a mental health day, (laughs) Um, but also implement practices. So maybe they don't feel so burnt out. They have to take a mental health day. Yeah. Like change the system uh, easier said than done. I don't want people to think that I'm like, Oh yeah. <laughs> so simple. <laughs> like it's, <laughs> it's challenging. And so many companies right now are struggling with this because it's hard. It is hard. And I would argue, and I think I've said this before, my philosophy is there aren't any born people leaders or managers because it's something that you need, you need to learn and you need to know how to just really foster your, your team and you know maybe there's born visionaries and just like folks who are great at motivating people but it is different than managing a person or people on your team because everybody is different and it's it's a learned skill it's nothing to be you know everybody is learning and leveling up but yeah. um a lot of the things that we're talking about go to this greater idea of at work a lot of articles are writing about psychological safety in the workplace and that's something that we really value at all voices as well in terms of giving and getting feedback, making sure that you feel seen from your coworkers and, you know, colleagues and also managers. In your opinion, what are really like key components to that psychological safe workplace? Um, Great question. And I am so happy that all voices does place such importance on this because a lot of people do not. Yeah. Um, I think some of the biggest pieces, the biggest piece here to me is that they see you as a whole person with a life outside of work um, and understand that um, <laughs> like at the end, this is controversial. Um, sorry in advance. Like at the <laughs> end of the day, it is labor for money. Like, and there's this really interesting ethos in a lot of brands that like people need to love it and it's the best and it's like no you're paying someone to do tasks and so that is like (laughs) people don't want to hear that people don't want to hear it yeah (laughs) no 
Um, and I, I knew that before I said it, but um, I think that, and that was a mantra I had when I was having a really difficult time um, with a former client of mine, I would be like labor for money. And it was like my mantra, um, which is so sad. But I think that if companies can realize that, okay, this person has a life outside of work, hopefully, um, wh- whatever their personal life looks like. And as a young person, I don't know if you've felt this, I have felt this and I had a lot of friends feel this, that like, because it was going out to dinner with friends versus going home to a husband or a wife or a partner and a child, it had less value and shouldn't be prioritized. And I literally remember thinking, well, if I don't go out to dinner or go out to drinks, I'm not going to meet someone to have a family (laughs) with. So like, how do you reconcile that in your brain? Um, So recognizing that like, however people want to spend their personal time, whether it is working out, whether it's being with friends and family, whatever it is that like to expect someone to work every single day, 12, 14 hour days is not realistic. So, right. So just like the biggest piece and it sounds so like trite is just like being respectful that like people have other things that they want to do. And I think depending on what industry you're in, a lot of things can be optics. So yes, you have to respond to the email that night. You have to, when it comes in at 9.30 or 10, like, or you have to stay and sit at your office, even though there's nothing to do because the client is going to see you leave at seven, where in reality, you could have gone to the gym, you could have gone to dinner and then logged back in at 9.30 when they sent you the email and done some work then. Um, So I think... I'm hoping that companies seeing how much success can be had remote people will be less stringent about optics and staying. So I don't know, but I'd be interested to hear how other people answer that question. I'm excited to listen to some other episodes. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think it's important to point out too what you said about people not wanting to hear that it is labor for money. It is a huge privilege to love and enjoy your job. And I definitely recognize that working at the tech company is and just like the experience that I am lucky to have been able to have to believe in the mission and, you know, for everyone to be successful or to live the life that they want to live outside of or inside of work. Passion is something that could be a possibility or it could not be. Uh, So I definitely, you know, appreciate that. Well, and I think in the last like 10 years, like we as millennials, are you feel guilty if you don't love your job like I'm supposed to love it everyone loves it they talk about how much they love work and I don't love it like what's wrong with me that I don't love it is like this fun mind game that some people (laughs) do (laughs) yeah you know I I definitely agree with you and it's definitely a societal value as well in terms of a lot of our kind of experiences working towards getting that dream job, the ideal job and spending all of your time there and, you know, working, working to get to the next goal, to the next goal, to the next goal. Um, so it definitely plays into, plays into that as well. We've discussed a lot today, <laughs> yes, um, yes. but I want to know if there's anything else that you want to share with our listeners uh, who've been kind of involved in this conversation as well. And also importantly, how folks can keep in touch with you and listen to, to the podcast. Sure. Um, So I think just at the end of the day, um, as far as dealing with grieving coworkers, or if you yourself are going through a loss um, at work, um, to just, it is totally understandable if you want to distract yourself and throw yourself into work. I know plenty of people who did that. Um, But if you need to take time and you need to take vacation or bereavement or whatever, like give yourself the time because if you deal with all of this hard stuff, like it makes it easier long-term. Um, it's not fun, but it's really important to like let yourself feel these things and to kind of work through the process, whatever that looks like for you. And then for those who are looking to support people grieving, like don't overthink it. And just like, I heard about this. I'm so sorry. And I'm here for you. That's it. So, um, 
Yeah. Don't overthink it is my advice, I guess. So if um, you want to <laughs> hear more about the podcast, um, you can go to the grief co um, on social at the underscore grief coach, and it is available wherever um, you stream your podcast. And I hope you listen. Um, don't feel like you need to start from the beginning. Just go to like whatever feels right to you. I really take a lot of care to be um, highlighting a lot of different stories and experiences. So just go um, to whatever you're drawn to. Well, with 52 episodes and growing, there's a lot of things that you can pick there from. Is. There um, is. We'll include all the links in your in your bio as well. But Brooke, I really appreciated our conversation. And, you know, I look forward to keeping in touch and seeing all the amazing work you're doing because it is is really hard to talk about this for, for your job. Yeah, absolutely. Um, thank you so much for having me. You're a wonderful interviewer. And I'm so glad that All Voices is supporting conversations like this. So thank you for having me. Yes, absolutely. Thank you so much at All Voices. We believe in the empowerment of everyone to speak up and creating a place where everyone feels they can speak up is a need to have in order for everyone to succeed. I'll see you later, Brooke. Thank you. See you. Bye.